every minute of every day, one of America's 600 railway companies rolls a train out of a terminal. Ever on the move, over the greatest network of rails in the world, trains carry people, goods, and mail. Mail by rail helps tie together the business economy, the free press, and the human relations of this great country. For a few pennies in postage, great industries, publishers, small businesses, and just plain people hire postal transportation service on every railroad crisscrossing the United States. There are hundreds of railway post offices built and owned by the railroads and rented to the Bureau of Transportation of the Post Office Department. Called RPO cars and manned by hard-working postal transportation crews, they provide almost half a billion miles of valuable service every year. In addition to trains, today, highway post offices help speed the mail to every corner of the country. These vehicles regularly travel established routes on fixed schedules. Working with fittings similar to those in a railway post office car, one or more clerks and a driver serve about 20 post offices twice a day. In an expanding postal service, many forms of transportation are used. Among these are buses, trains, ships, and planes. Airmail service is also a vital activity. Mail of all classes, except that which may be damaged by low temperatures or high altitudes, is accepted for airmail. Postal transportation clerks distribute airmail in terminals right at the airfields, much the same as they work on trains and buses. Working the nation's mail 24 hours a day, seven days a week, takes a lot of men, an army of public servants. Who are these men? They might be like Kathy Smith, the man next door. Let's stay with him and watch a typical RPO clerk's workday right from the beginning. That's Cappy's wife. She's as proud of his job as he is. In addition to doing important work, the job is paying for their house and is sending their girl to college. The letter was from the office. Notification that Cappy was to break in a new man on his next run. In another part of the city, the substitute clerk, Phil Davis, was also getting ready. Like thousands of other clerks, regulars, and subs, he was doing his homework, stamping facing slips with his name, RPO train, and date. These slips are the means of tracing missent mail. Like all subs, Phil was excited about his new job. Until the skills were learned, it all seemed tough, which is natural. The package of slips are part of the equipment Phil will need on the job. Since he had time, the practice case was on his mind. And as he had done many times, he began throwing cards. This, in miniature, is the job of distributing mail according to a set pattern. In this way, all clerks learned the schedules and schemes and filled up their speed. Their periodic examinations are conducted the same way. Rehearsed and confident, Phil was now ready for his first run as a postal transportation clerk. In Cappy's house, a similar scene was underway. Although he always kept his road grip packed, Cappy carefully checked its contents before leaving home. Tags and slips, revolver, holster and shells, schedules and schemes, badge and manual, goggles, pencils, twine knife, labels, stamp and pad. He knew that on the road, it's difficult or impossible to obtain the tools of his trade. After checking the grip, Cappy checked his wallet for travel commission, revolver permit, and money. In addition to lunch, there were work clothes to prepare and pack. Safety toe shoes, cap, gloves, shirt and pants. At last, Cappy was ready. He liked the layoffs his job gave him. The nature of the work requires working in accordance with railroad schedules. 
So this was goodbye, Mrs. Smith, until next week. As the city awakens, the railroad terminal comes to life. Here is where most postal transportation men have to report for work. At the transfer office in the railroad station was where Cappy Smith had the appointment to meet Phil Davis. This is the place where RPO crews assemble before going out to the cars, where they pick up notices and where they just meet the boys. Phil arrived first and was looking around as Cappy showed up. Cappy liked the boy right off. Thought he would make the grade because he showed interest. The old timer put the newcomer at ease by showing him the ropes. Explained the order book for special orders and general notices. After checking the RPO schedule, they went to the wall map where Cappy traced the geography of the trip they were about to take. The route, the time due at various towns, the pouch list, and the terminus. From the questions Phil asked, it was clear he was bright and had done his homework. Their next stop was the blackboard where U.S. mail car assignments were listed. Together, they read the track location and number of their car. After Cappy explained the board, they headed for their car. On the way, Cappy warned the new man to be alert to new dangers to watch out for station tractors and railroad switching equipment. Cappy warned Phil never to cross tracks unless it was absolutely necessary. They watched a track man do it easily and right. There it was, an RPO car. 62 tons and costing more than $50,000. Cappy demonstrated the safe way to board. Grasp high up on the handrails, left foot on the first step, then shift weight to the next step. Duck low under the catcher arm. Phil got the idea. After sliding his grip aboard, he climbed into the car correctly. Cappy gave him a further word of caution Never try to enter a moving car. As soon as Cappy switched on the case lights, Phil snapped on the car lights. They looked around the clean, quiet car and began to change into their work clothes. In a few hours, this calm seed will take on a new look as the train crew goes to work to sort the mail on the road, to catch the mail on the fly, and to help the letter carriers bring the public tidings of sadness and gladness, news and business. Right after they changed into work clothes, they strapped on holsters and pinned on their badges. They both knew the rules covering the use of firearms. Not to leave loaded revolvers at home, nor carry them loaded between home and depot. And finally, always to point the revolver downward to avoid accidents while loading. After Phil loaded his revolver correctly, Cappy explained the time rule. How, if a clerk is due to work at a certain time, he must be in work clothes and ready at that time. These men were working advance time, that is, time in which the crew prepares the railway or highway post office and distributes mail prior to the scheduled departure from the terminal. After Cappy unpacked his road grip and laid out the tools of his trade, he hung his clipboard. As supervisor, he had a lot more paperwork than any other clerk in his crew. Cappy was now ready to set up the car, and he asked Phil to help him. Together, they fastened the pedestals to the floor plate to provide a solid base for the tables. Next, they placed the center rods on top of the pedestals to support the full length of table. For now, they temporarily hung the sections of the distributing table on the crossbar. Eventually, these sections would be made up as a strong work table with stationary pedestal legs. Observing safety measures, Cappy showed Phil how to let down all the racks that would be needed. He particularly cautioned Phil against bumping his head on the overhead box hooks. Although Cappy was completely familiar with the car diagram, he hung it up as a guide for Phil. The car diagram showed where sacks and pouches 
were to be hung in each rack. Next, Cappy demonstrated how to check for mail which may have been left in the empty sacks, inserting his arm to open the entire sack for inspection. Then as Cappy hung the sacks, Phil took up the job of inspection, holding each sack open and looking for mail. The post office uses 25 million sacks and pouches. If a letter were lost in one of them, it might be lost a long time. The metal eyes were placed on hooks, so set that the sides of each sack became taut, leaving no space between sacks. After being pulled tight, the tie cards were hung over the rail and dropped into the sack. Finally, all the racks were dressed. This business is full of such unique terms, and since they're widely used, it is well for all employees to know them. When Phil asked Cappy to check his work, Cappy pointed out a hole between the sacks where mail might slip through. This was easily corrected by rehooking and tightening the tie cords. Together, instructor and student checked over the job, making sure the racks were dressed according to the car diagram. It was important to know the differences between a sack, which is used for newspapers and parcel post, and a pouch, which is used for first class mail, and then the label holders for the two containers, as well as the different methods of closing. The sack is tied with cords, while the pouch is strapped and sealed with a lock. Yes, there was a lot to learn about the job of becoming a postal transportation clerk. Next, the labels. How they first mark the various separations and later serve to label the sacks when they're ready to be tied out. Labels have to be inserted according to the same diagram which set the pattern for hanging the sacks. Nothing to this job as long as you follow directions. But put one label in the wrong holder and an awful lot of mail may be missent. The substitute proved to be a quick learner, a necessary talent for all postal transportation clerks. Together, they distributed the labels in all the overhead boxes and in all the sacks and pouches. Now, they put sections of the distributing table in place. Cappy raised the table, resting the front hooks on the center bar, and being careful of his hands, grasp the back hinge hooks and release them to slip over the rod of the adjoining rack section. In this case, the diagram called for a double distributing table. And the men were ready when the mail arrived. As always, it was quite a load. When the mail porter got his truck in position, Cappy and Phil were on hand to take in mail for storage and for working. The mail was accepted and the load was stacked according to plan. As the sacks were taken on board, the labels were read quickly and accurately. Bulk mail has to be stored so that it may be unloaded at various points on the run. Cappy kept his eye on the sub. There were many safety precautions to observe while stacking bulk mail. Tie cords have to be kept out of the aisles. They're a tripping hazard. He showed Phil how to make a good base for the pile, arranging the sack so as to leave about an 18-inch aisle. A solid foundation will prevent movement of the train from toppling the sacks. Lifting a heavy item incorrectly risks injury. The right way to lift is feet apart, bent knees, back straight, firm grasp, and a steady upward thrust of the legs. Then the mail is stored between stanchions in such a way that the clerk knows what each separation contains. Phil soon got the hang of it and began to place heavy, bulky items at the bottom, starting the base of the pile as far out as possible. Together, they lifted the extra heavy ones. Two men lifting a load divides the weight.
In the meantime, mail was also being loaded in the storage car, usually adjoining the RPO car. As Phil continued to stack bulk mail in the RPO car, he learned that dragging the sacks is an easy way to move them. And as the piles got higher, Phil began to use the knee lift, which gave the load an extra push to assist in putting up a sack. Fragile items, like this box of chicks, were put aside to be placed on top of the pile. In the meantime, the remainder of the crew arrived. Supplies of twine and locks were unloaded and distributed to the men at their stations. The clerks immediately set up their cases in order to perform their advanced distribution of mail. Important mail like registered, which may contain money, documents, or any other things of value, is always given special handling. To maintain integrity of the mails, many procedures are followed which make it possible to know exactly who handles each registered letter every step of the way. For instance, one man on each crew is designated the register clerk, and reds, the familiar term given to registered mail, are his responsibility for the entire run. The man who handles registers should have special knowledge of routing and distributing registered matter. Registered pouches are sealed with special locks which record every time they are opened. After dumping the pouch, the clerk makes sure it's empty. The registers are individually checked before they can be written up for dispatch. The pouchman first distributes letter packages containing number one mail. Mail which can be worked later is held back. The letter slips are left on the top letter of each package in order that the clerk can check missent mail. Later, the same letter slip is saved as each package is distributed. Once the mail is ready, the clerk begins distributing letters by reading each address and flipping each letter into its right pigeonhole. Number one letter mail contains mail for the first towns through which the RPO will pass. The distributor at the paper rack gives priority to newspapers, parcel post, and ordinary papers in just that order. But number one mail means what it says. It's worked first. Flipping newspapers neatly into the sacks is an art that all clerks learn. Just before departure, the transfer clerk shows up with a consist, which is a record of the cars in the train, the amount of storage mail loaded in the RPO, as well as the storage car. He also checks if there are any pouches which they hadn't received. To prevent robbery or mail falling out of the car, the doors are kept closed and locked. This is one job where a man can't be late in reporting to work. This office moves. People's mail, going someplace, coming from someplace. People's possessions, things they are buying, selling, or giving away, on the move. The most exciting thing about handling mail, when you stop to think of it, is that each letter contains a person's thoughts, his hopes, business, love, and promises, neatly folded in a tiny package. The important thing is that these men help make sure each item arrives at its destination on time. Once on a run, the schedule becomes part of them. Cappy checks his watch spots a familiar landmark. Then knowing they were nearing their first station, begins to tie out packages of letters to be put off. And here's where the facing slip comes in. It tells who worked each package on which train and when. Every letter package is neatly tied with a minimum of motions. 
Then with a finger knife, the twine is cut. These tie-outs are given to the pouch man who distributes them. Care is taken to get all packages of first-class letters for this destination in the right pouches. These pouches are strapped and locked and then taken to the end of the car for eventual dispatch. Sacks of newspapers and parcels are also tied out. To empty the overhead boxes, empty sacks are hung on the hooks below. Labels from the boxes are transferred to the sack label holders before the boxes are emptied of their contents. These sacks are then tied out and locked. With the help of the substitute, the load is moved to the car door. The train pulled into the station on time. The mail was going to be transferred with the help of station employees and mail messengers. Phil was given the job to pull the box, which means emptying the letter box at a stop station. He emptied the box and was careful to carry the letters in a pouch. Locking the box, unloading and loading the sacks of mail, and the station transfer was completed. That's all there is to it. In that brief exchange, which happens every minute of the day, many thousands of people are swiftly served by the Postal Transportation Service. As the run gets underway again, the fun begins. Men working the mail race the speeding train toward the next station. It's a driving force that keeps them on their toes and never lets them quit. Now watch how they catch mail on the fly with the help of a mail messenger. Ten minutes before the train is scheduled to pass a non-stop station, the mail messenger carefully hangs the special catcher pouch of mail. After it is securely fastened, top and bottom, he steps aside and waits nearby to witness the catch and receive any mail which may be thrown off. Aboard the train, local mail is being tied out as the clerk spots his landmark. This was it. Must get every letter package for this dispatch in the pouch and tied out. The race against time and speed was on. As soon as the last pouch was made ready, the clerk grabs his safety goggles and goes to his station. The engineer is required to signal the RPO car that they are approaching a non-stop station. And a dramatic moment is at hand. In Cappy's crew, the local clerk was getting ready to make an exchange. First, he put on his safety goggles. Then he tried the catcher arm. This time, for Phil's sake, he demonstrated the mechanism, pushing down to show the catcher arm being lifted outside the train. 
With one hand, he tossed the pouch out and down, assisted with his foot. With the other hand, he brought down the catcher handle, and the catch was made. A neat two-handed operation. To save the public precious hours and days in delivery, railway mail clerks sort and exchange great quantities of letters and printed matter. Yes, men and mail in transit. Speed the mail on speeding trains, affecting dramatic exchanges almost every minute of the day. A bullseye, the dispatch was delivered. Now, Phil, wearing safety goggles, got his first chance to make an exchange. On the fly. Like Phil, all new men qualify themselves quickly, provided they take up this work with a sense of responsibility and willingness to devote their best talents and efforts to the service. Cappy was right. Bill Davis was going to make the grade. These men who treat the nation's mail like it's their own ask for no salutes. Few jobs are more exacting. These men know no night or day. They are possessed of a retentive memory and a sense of honesty matched by few. These then are your postal transportation clerks in action, whose efforts and sacrifice speed onward the vital correspondence of our great nation come darkness, deluge, or disaster.